Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Elisha Johnson, and I'm one of four co-founders of Wanawari. If you don't already know, Wanawari is a Black art space in Seattle Central District. We use arts and culture to leverage um, the economics to be able to keep Black folks in their homes in this area. Um, so what we do that by exhibiting uh, four to five Black artists at a time in our galleries to have a diasporic conversation around what Blackness is. And then we also organize around what it means to be a Black homeowner in our city right now. We're lucky to have two of our exhibiting artists here today to do an artist talk with you, Lisa Myers Fulmash and Carletta Carrington Wilson. Um, their work is so intertwined in so many ways. When I curated them together in this exhibition, I knew that there would be a lot of synergy, but when you actually go into the show, sometimes you almost might not even know which artist is which artist. They're working with a lot of the same themes, working around the Black body. So I'm going to read their bios and then we're going to jump into their talk tonight. So um, Carletta Carrington Wilson's mixed media collages have been described as decorative with a message. Textiles, found objects, beads, paper revolved around central iconic image. These elements serve the purpose of enhancing and highlighting, inferring and interrogating the image and the ideas it presents and portrays. In addition to an iconic image, Wilson's collage series are accompanied by a title poem, which illuminates the sensibilities that are being visually expressed. Wilson said, my work continues to be an exploration of the text of textiles. I am an explorer of the ways of cloth, traveler on its byways, never tourist, neither voyeur, but curious, a questioner, a seeker of the unseen. Wilson's work can be found in the artist book collections of the Allen Library at the University of Washington, Collins Memorial Library at UPS, Swarthmore College, UCLA, um, and many more. She's exhibited at the Kitteridge Gallery at UPS, Elizabeth Miller Horticulture Library, University Gallery of Pacific Lutheran University and Art Exchange. Um, she's also shown at the Northwest African American Museum, Denver Public Library and North Seattle Community College Gallery. Um, in uh, 2011, she had a seminal exhibition with the Onyx Fine Arts Collective and she was artist in residence at the James W. Washington Foundation. Um, her cur currently, she has a show um, up until March um, 19th of 2022 at the Bainbridge Art Museum, and she's also obviously exhibiting at Wanawari. Lisa Myers Bullmash is a collage and book artist who works primarily in acrylics, paper, and found objects. Informally trained, Myers Bullmash began her career making handmade cards. After her father's death in 2006, the artist felt compelled to take more personal risks in her creative life. Questions of identity, trust, and the imperfect memory now drive most of her work. The artist aims to nudge the viewer into recognizing our shared stories, especially those narratives that are usually experienced in isolation. Collage work by Myers Bullmash resides in two city art collections, Shoreline in Seattle. The latter includes artwork by Barbara Earl Thomas, Dale Jahuli, and Kara Walker. She's also the winner of the Sustainable Arts Foundation grant, an award to support artists with children under the age of 18. The artist's work and commentary have been highlighted in five books as well. Myers Bullmesh exhibits her work in group and solo exhibitions throughout the Seattle area. And on the East Coast, she's represented by Morton Fine Art Gallery. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Myers Bullmesh and Carletta Carrington Wilson. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Lisa. I would like to echo um, Sheba when she says that um, my work and Carletta's work have a lot of similarities, a lot of echoes that seem to bounce back and forth between us two artists, even though we work completely on our own. Um, one of the issues that I'm most interested in as, a, as an artist is um, the vulnerability of black bodies. Um, this has been more important to me ever since we had the racial reckoning last summer and well before then when I had my first child who was a boy. Um, I later had another boy and the older they get, of course, the more I grow concerned for their safety when they're not within my protection. So um, I, I think about the vulnerability of black bodies a lot. 
I also think about um, stereotypes and how some of them can, most of them for people of African descent are damaging, but some of them, as we know, can be deadly. Let me show you some of the pieces that are in my show. My show is titled Holding Patterns. And let's take a look at that. All right, you got that? Yes, okay. So let me show you a couple of images. Okay, let's start with this one. This one is uh, one of two that I call my black sit altered books. And the reason why I call them black sit is because due to the pandemic, Due to the pandemic, as well as uh, the racial animus against me and everybody who looks like me and my children, um, I had escape on my mind for quite some time last year. And I wanted to create something that spoke to that need to escape, but I didn't want it to be just sort of a usual road trip or something like that. So what I did was I grabbed a couple of older pictures These are the kind of pictures that I like to work with in, um, in my pieces. Um, I prefer vintage and antique looking stuff. And this image actually comes from a repository that's down in Brazil. And so I decided to take these two people and imagine them discussing the possibility of escape and where they might go to. And then I added uh, an airship, only for me, I decided that this was going to be a space ready, space worthy airship that could take people away from everything that is just weighing so heavily on their minds and on their bodies. I did the same, I did something very similar with the other one. In this one, I have two women having a conversation about, are we gonna stay? Are we gonna go? So we're about to bar board, they're calling us. And for this one, I added, you can see some of the, um, you can see some of the people in tents uh, in a long line outside of the tents. And then another, space ready Zeppelin. Um, I want to start thinking more about black futures, but for me right now, it's kind of hard to do that. I am so immersed in the present and what has happened in the past that feels like it's just going to repeat itself over and over again, that this is for the moment, the closest I can get to imagining a black future. And on to another piece, since this one keeps on popping up, I will show this to you. Uh, this one it was created thinking about where people might be able to go and how they might be able to connect with each other after the pandemic dies down enough for us to travel relatively safely. And depending on where you are in, on the, in the world, in this country, your choices may be more or less restricted, but at least you can think about what you can do after some of those restrictions are lifted. So I took these people who used to be much closer together and spread them apart as if they were social distancing. And then, oops. Oh, this is fun. Let's try this again. All right. And then I added some stamps above their heads um, with a sort of thought bubble um, pixelation around them to convey some of the some of the thoughts that we might be having about traveling and about 
just getting out of the place where we are so we can see something other than the four walls and the neighborhood we've been walking through or the stairs we've been climbing up and down. This piece is also uh, about the pandemic. This is more about the isolation that was created by sending the kids home so that they would be uh, relatively safer from the COVID-19 virus. Everything felt so topsy-turvy that I wanted to use an image that had both the image and a reflection in the water. And I found this schoolhouse image um, in a copyright free collection. And I transferred the original image opposite um, I transferred the original image opposite it and I like the way it's sort of blurry and soft the way you would see it in water but because everything has felt so disjointed I decided to flip the picture and have the students and the teacher on the reflection side. This is what it would look like if I did what I usually do, which is to layer old fashioned and vintage images on top of things, on top of images that are more contemporary. But because of all the strangeness of just getting used to being more isolated and being concerned about my kids and their socialization, I decided to upend it. So let's take this one, this piece is an assemblage sculpture. Um, basically assemblage is like 3D collage. And this piece I created because I started thinking about how heavily black and brown bodies were impacted by the infections and the death rates for COVID-19. And so as I was going through my stash of stuff, images and things like flashcards. I saw the one that said race, kind, sort. And I thought, oh, maybe this is an opening to this. And so I found another one that says, it refers to um, a cure, uh, managing a disease and I thought that was really appropriate considering how there are so many people who are ready to call the pandemic over, even though we are most definitely not over it. And this little guy up in the attic, whoops. All right, let me show you the guy in the attic. You see that this little statue uh, with its head knocked off. Um, I looked at it more carefully uh, for another piece I was thinking about doing, but then I realized this one works perfectly for what I'm trying to say about people taking risks with other people's lives by not getting vaccinated, not mas masking up, and insisting that it was their right to make these health decisions that would of course impact everybody around them. So I decided to use the headless statue, which also seems to be um, a figurine of a little boy holding a bow and arrow. And I thought that was interesting too, because many of the people who consider the COVID-19 vaccines to be untrustworthy or just not tested enough, a lot of these people are also armed. So I thought I would point that out as well. And this pair of Ulta books, uh, I had to have paired because I found the one that says Black Mischief first. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I knew I wanted to use it somehow, but it wasn't until I found the one that's titled The Strain of White that I really started to get some ideas coming together. This duo is mostly about how literally 
our society, the way it's built now, would not exist without the labor and the care of Black people, especially Black women, which is why I decided to focus on this woman who I'm assuming is a nanny to two white kids. And I've overlaid her image over um, a group of people having a party and celebrating. I tried to repurpose some of these images and to take the gaze, to turn the gaze from a white one into a black one. So I am more interested in, in the woman who's taking care of the kids. I am more interested in the people who are enjoying themselves in the background. And for this niche, again, there's another woman taking care of a pair of kids. In the background is an illustration of a woman on a fainting couch with a man checking her pulse. And that one was particularly interesting to me because I was thinking about how there's this myth of fragility that seems to apply to almost every woman but Black women. And without our labor, without our care, without our activism, none of this stuff works at all. None of this, none of these hierarchies, none of our power structure, none of it works at all. And one last one, uh, this piece <laughs> I titled Today, America, Today. And you can probably see that this is, so this reflects some of my concerns about global warming. Um, and again, I wanted to center the black people here. And I realized through my research that black people and brown people usually suffer the worst in natural disasters or, ma or man-made disasters. And this has happened time and time again throughout our history. I wanted to move the, I wanted to change the view of these people from victims to authorities on how to survive. So that's why I decided to bring these two people into the foreground. And then there are some white people in this, in this picture, but they're in the background. And the image of, of the man who's talking to him, talking to the white family seems to be saying, we have to go. You don't understand. We have to go right now. I think it's interesting that there are so many repeated patterns in our history, especially in American history. And yet somehow we still manage not to learn from these things. We, we seem to do everything we can, but learn from them. Um, fabulous, fabulous, Lisa. Um, so many things for me to think about. Um, I was I appreciated a couple of things you said. One about the mechanisms for you to be able to think about a black future, right? I think we kind of take that for granted with so much black futurism around that like a lot of black folks are not in a place to actually think about what, it, you know, what an imaginary or hopeful future looks like. Um, exactly. If you don't have the bandwidth beyond getting food on the table and having a roof over your head, how are you going to imagine next week, let alone five years from now? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I also just appreciated that you were inspired to make work and process through the pandemic. So many artists, other artists I know, couldn't make anything. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Well, that's the way I started out. Uh, for the first couple of months, maybe three months, I think, I just couldn't because I was in this constant state of readiness. Even though I wasn't going anywhere, my kids weren't going anywhere, I just felt like I couldn't give my attention fully to anything else, um, including my work, because I felt like sooner or later, I'm going to have to switch gears and I'm just going to have to be completely in survival mode. And then I read that 
psychologists were saying that people's minds are in survival mode. And I thought, wow, it's good to know that I'm not the only person. And so getting back to the word take, it took a while. Um, I'm very happy that, uh, that I've been able to create work um, last year and this year, but it is time for people to just get a grip and realize, you know, we have a pandemic. We have lots of racial problems. What are we waiting for? I love it. I love it. Well, um, Carlotta, are you ready? Yep. Perfect. We're going to transition into you and then, uh, yeah, so. Okay. All right. So here we are. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate sharing this evening with Lisa. I love it when our paths cross and we are sharing the same stage, whether it's the wall stage or, or just here. So um, uh, let's, here we go. Night of the Stereotypes is an installation. It's an installation that includes a zine. This is the cover of the zine. Um, mixed media textiles, photography, um, and assemblage. Alain Locke in The New Negro said, art must discover and reveal the beauty which prejudice and caricature have overlaid. Deployed to stand in for individuals our society refused to acknowledge and recognize, caricatures were objects of ridicule and weapons of war and the battle for not only the possession of the black body, but control over its image. In Night of the Stereotypes, there are two primary characters and that is Mammy and Piccaninny. Mm -hmm. The installation at times makes a juxtaposition between the stereotypical image and the realis realistic image. And that's where I am, as I decide it's like riffing on these images and responding to them. Now, who exactly was Mammy? Well, as you can see, Mammy always has something in her hand. She is not an idle woman. She's never been an idle woman. And I think it's interesting that this term that was attached to Black women of Mammy, like Mammy Pratter or Hume, Hume's Mammy. But if you notice these women, they are either engaged in labor or you can see where their labor is a part of their identity in this image. Well, Mammy was a household necessity from enslavement to post uh, emancipation. These women were held basically in the environments of a home. Uh, and so there's this again uh, double entendre of talking about, you know, the slave aspect, but also post enslavement. So the works um, include images, stereotypical images um, paired, as I mentioned, with realistic portrayals. This is a, a lithograph um, from the 19th century. Um, the work is uh, encaustic. The hand here, you'll see this red hand uh, on several works, which um, to me symbolize that slavery is a bloody business. Now, this is Mary Bryce. I thought it was interesting that first of all, you can see the rather ornate frame for Mary Bryce you notice that she has not been identified as a mammy. Uh, is the fan in her hand, is that 
for her own use or is this the last job of this aged African woman that she has to do in this household? If you notice her face, she is expressing a kind of tension or concern. She's looking you know, into the camera uh, and, and at the photographer um, with tension in her face. So I wanna say that, you know, these women were with these families for generations. And while they may have been described as uh, just one of the family, that really was not the case. So this is one of the assemblage pieces um, at the very end, it says, faithful servitor, who were your ancestors? And that's the kind of um, question because basically these women were generational. What I mean uh, is that not only did they do this work, but their daughters did it also. So when did they go into that big house? Well, they went when they were young and in their prime and they stayed until their death days. So this apron is, uh, it demonstrates the embroidered mistress on the apron is out in the garden cutting flowers. On her waist, she holds the key to the pantry, which only she can unlock. The hands of course represent um, her, servant. And what does it say? Feed me. That is her job. However, the text says, I was young and in my prime. What does she do? She cooks, she washes dishes. All of her life energy and force is to provide the comfort and safety for the mistress and the family. However, I put a little pun in there at the hem, at the bottom hem of the apron, there's a quote, which is actually from uh, the, a, a slave narrative, which says, make me a little hoe cake and draw me a pot of coffee. I just, I don't know why I find that funny, but <laughs> that's what she should be saying to that woman. This, the other thing I wanna say is the text, the titles of the pieces, also correspond to texts inside the zine. So here is the page where I was young and in my prime. However, I want to point out that this mammy, like Aunt your Mama, is smiling and appears happy. However, the reality was if this woman had this many children, all of those children or most of those children would probably be sold away from her and she would not see them again. This is the installation view of that piece. Um, I was young and in my prime. Um, I also wanna make note of the watermelon, which I will just talk about later. But in terms of stereotypes, it was not only the black body that became the object for stereotypical um, distortion. Also the watermelon. So this is one of the textile pieces. There are two. They're hand, hand, hand towels and text from the zine is included on here. And uh, Piccaninny, who's on the top there inside the little flower, is asking Mammy in, in the zine, Mammy, is we gonna die for true? And Mammy says, honey, well, we gonna try. And so in the journey that they're taking in Night of the Stereotypes, it is to transform themselves into flesh and blood. Here is an installation view. Um, the pieces there is in the top cabinet there, there is a, a Mammy doll. doll. There's also the faithful servitors. Unfortunately, the lighting isn't as strong, um, but the house piece is been used in publicity. So you can really see what that looks like. This is the second hand towel, tell of the selling. And this one does focus on 
the watermelon, not just the watermelon, but above in the flower is a portrait of an African. This piece tells of the selling in the hold of the soul. And basically that not only is the black body to be consumed as an object of consumption in terms of their labor, but their image also is involved in the selling of pr products. So then we get to the plantation because basically neither the stereotypes, the, the off scene is this plantation. In this case, um, a sugarcane plantation, uh, blood O on his rum. Of the, of the commodities of sugarcane, um, rice, tobacco, cotton, the sugarcane plantation was the most deadly. And the survival rate there was con considerably more brutal than for the other plantation, not that it wasn't brutal all along. Hence the bones that are encased in this piece. This is a view which shows the textile piece um, encaustic and on the counter, we see a jar full of cotton with a crown, which is symbolic for, I gotta go back, which is symbolic for King Cotton. And basically that is the commodity in which I see this work coming out of. As I mentioned that not only was the black body used in terms of labor, but also in, in, in the selling of so many kinds of products. Here we go with eight cotton bale remedies, which I thought was really amazing. So they have cotton bale blood elixir, cotton bale liniment, um, cotton bale tonic for chills and fevers. And of course, there's the ubiquitous field um, and people engaged in the labor. So you're doing double, triple labor. Well, also in those fields are going to be children. Nary log, no cotton bin to be playing up in. That's what Mammy is saying to Piccaninny um, when their transformation is going to take place. There's also a visual pun here. The two peas are like peas in a pod. And across from those is a watermelon. And often you will see this pairing of African-American children eating the watermelon. Again, there's the hand with the blood. And so we are talking about King Cotton. And so these are symbolic of these three figures. Of course, you know, symbolically there's the crown for the king, there's the mistress, and then there is the gollywog who, of course you can see is a distorted image. And that's because there's this piece called spinning spun. And we can spin the tail, we can spin it any way we want, but what happens is under slavery in the cotton economy, the Europeans had these dances and festivities and leisure at their hand. On the other hand, the African is um, carding or, 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 or holding the banana, um, banana um, fronds. And I, I have to tell you, I was in Costa Rica some decades ago and I saw these uh, banana plantations and it literally was amazing. You could see where our bananas are coming from and the people who are doing that labor. So as the tail gets spun, you can see this woman here on the right glancing back because this labor has been spun into the stereotypical figure. And this has been the struggle post emancipation, there was a proliferation of all of these images. And it, to this day, 
is the struggle of African-Americans to refute these images. And if you think about it, the images have traveled further and lived longer than the people. So do you ever think of owning your own home? Well, here we go. We're, we're talking about people in the field and people in the house, but you're not better off in, in many ways either way, because when you're in the house, it's not your house. It's never your home, but yet you are required to care for it. You're required to clean it. You're required to prepare food that you will not really be able to consume. I learned recently that, you know, the image of the mammy as a large woman was really not true. They were really very thin because they were not fed and they had to literally scrounge for their food. In this piece, of course, there's the salt and uh, pepper shaker, there's the cup, and they are in a cloud of cotton uh, juxtaposed with a realistic image of um, a baker. So in the zine, I asked, mate, do you ever think about owning your own home? What are you gonna do? Wash dishes, cook, smile, work. And um, on the left here, it's, it's Mammy saying, eyes going back, eyes going traveling back because the transformation is kind of like in Twilight Zone. They only have a certain amount of time to be real. Here again is a commodity, um, the image of the African, not just the image, but the language was used to sell products, in this case, uh, coffee. Your folks, folks used to make good gravy. And I wanted to point out that on the right here, again, the role of children, because children are brought into either the households, but they are trained by the adults to take their place. So this is my last shot. Um, well, next to the last shot. Um, I wanted to say that um, I'm very appreciative of Elisheba being open to hosting this exhibit. It really was, um, you know, weren't sure how it was going to turn out. So if you do come, if you come and um, visit, please sign the guest book. This is a guest book I found. Um, it was really just said notes, but I found out that I could put night of the stereotypes in there and it was the perfect piece for people to leave their comments. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carletta. I'm like further marinating on my own kind of thoughts and ideas about all those images that come from um, post-slavery and mammies and the bucks and mulana, uh, mulattos and all of that. And I appreciate you deconstructing that. Um, and really both of your work, you both said your work is about the black body. Um, so I'd love to give you both the time to kind of just elaborate on that further. Why are you called um, in your work to really focus on the black body in particular as a liberatory kind of um, thinking space? Well, for me, um, the black body has so many, so many representations that it's, it's never generated on its own. Um, there's so much meaning and value judgment that is placed on the black body that has nothing to do with the person in that body. Mm -hmm. um, I also find it interesting that there are so many um, myths of us being indestructible, whether we're super athletes or whether we're long suffering mammies or whatever. So that justifies treating the black body in any way that you want because it'll bounce back or if, even if it doesn't, you can always get another one. Well, you know, frankly, it's always been about the black body. That's where they went to the continent. They didn't go to find out who these people were and what the, what they knew what they were capable of doing. They knew about the rice. They went deep to get the agriculturalists. 
So they were specific in choosing and it was based on their body. At first, they really were only selecting men. They were not selecting the women. So, but so it has always been about the black body. However, it has not always been about definition. The Africans were not allowed self-definition. That was stripped. And that is why I think we continue to struggle with this because there's this overlay of definition of people saying, well, this is who you are. And that's why even among African Americans, you find, you know, colored, Negro, Black, African American, all of these terms struggling as a people because we, we come from disparate Africans. So it is not, we can't say that we, you know, came from this specific place or these specific people. Very, very few of us are going to be able to do that. Yes, as a matter of fact, that reminded me um, the the skills in addition to the bodies that um, the slavers were selecting for. I got a chance to watch the uh, the food documentary High on the Hog, which is all about African um, based cuisine and African-American cuisine and the links between the two continents. And the part where they were talking about rice in South Carolina with, uh, with a guy who was trying to bring back that particular strain oh. of rice and introduce it into the market was really interesting because, well, first of all, it was called Carolina gold. Um, and, you know, in South Carolina, gold, uh, Rice was really the money maker, rather uh, some tobacco, some cotton, but really the money was in the rice. And uh, the person who is heading that company is white, but he fully acknowledges that he would he wouldn't be here, that he wouldn't have this opportunity to try and bring back this strain if it weren't for the people and their skills who first cultivated it and usually died cultivating it. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. Um, lots and lots of incredible comments, no specific questions, which is fine because I get to ask my question, um, which is you both, um, you know, really mine the archive, right? Um, Carletta as now a retired librarian. And then, you know, Lisa, um, I really didn't understand until we went to a studio visit just how much your practice is really going to the National Archives and looking through those images. So if you both could talk a little bit about that process and why you're really interested in like bringing the path forward to have a a contemporary conversation. I guess for me, uh, there are two reasons why um, I like to bring the past forward as you were saying. One is to give a new, give well, give a truer definition of the black body and position it in places that it should, it always should have been. Uh, the other reason is that uh, was because a lot of uh, image repositories and archives started making their images and their text public. And it really has snowballed in the last two, three years. Um, and there's, there are even grants that are specifically for, pe- for institutions to digitize their collections so that everybody can get a chance to look at them. And that has been my life for the last five years, probably. Whenever I hear of another archive or another collection of images that is coming up, I at least flip through it just to see if there's anything that will catch my eye. Well, it, the, the thing is that um, for me, I don't even know exactly what I'm seeking, but I'm seeking something from the past. And it is through these various projects that I, and and particularly say for a night of the stereotypes, I really don't know. I mean, I have this title comes into my mind. I say night of the stereotypes. And then I'm like, well, what's that about? You know? (laughs) And then I said, well, let's look for some images. I have to tell you, I really had a difficult time and I still do 
with this with these images you know they're really hard um the the thing is is that uh fortunately like at, at the library at seattle public library the the periodical section which is not open now but you know um there are the magazines from the 19th century there that you could go and i just made copy after copy after copy i just copy 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 and i also copied the text because i wanted to also have this text look you know dynamic and interesting um but i have to tell you when i was so looking at the images, I did not select the most, the worst. There were some I said, I'll never, not that, not that. And in fact, in the zine, yeah. as it progresses, I use less and less of the images and use more and more of the text because they really still bother me. However, it's interesting because people have said to me, oh, and these are people who are older than me. I, uh, Oh, these, these were all over the place when I was young. So they were ubiquitous, these images. And if you think about how many African-Americans had to see these images that erased them, that erased the people, and these were representing them. So there's something about that period. And I think that, well, that's my grandparents. It's the era that they lived through. And I think through kind of moving through this, I understand what life was like in a way for them. Um, my final question for both of you is, you know, you're both using recycled found objects, which I actually have started thinking in the last couple months. Um, I'm starting to think of that as a black vernacular, right? I, I went to there was artists in Atlanta that were kind of doing assemblage. Um, I went to Noah Purfoy not that long ago and he just did all this assemblage in the desert, right? And, and, and had a whole practice for that. And there's David Hammonds and all these people that do that. And I kind of think one is because as black folks and artists, we're kind of just taking what is in our environment and creating with it. But I'm also so. really curious about, for again, both of you use this in your practice people have come into the gallery and have commented on both of your work in this way. So just um, let you elaborate on that a little bit. Um, I'm interested partly in the materiality of these older pieces that I rework or redesign or split or alter in some way. Uh, it's interesting that much of the paper I use that's from an old book, say from 1901, the paper texture and weight is much different than what you would find in say a pack of printer paper because they're not, we're not using the same processes. We're not trying to preserve the paper that the text is on because we have other options. Um, another thing that I really like about um, repurposing other pieces, um, other pieces you know, of, of ephemera, of uh, children's toys, that kind of thing. I really like the fact that I feel more of their, more of their past life, <laughs> if you could say that. Um, I, I like things that have patina. I, have, I like things that are worn because of somebody's hand being on it for years and years and years. And so it's partly, it's partly an aesthetic thing and partly, um, something to subtly tell the viewer that this was this was useful, this was important to somebody. I love that. You're the caretaker of these very unique, special objects. Good. And really the storyteller. I'll let Carletta jump in now. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I agree with, with you, Lisa. I actually um, consider myself a hunter. And these pieces have a story, they have energy. And uh, I see, you know, now a person that, an artist that has been a huge influence on me is Betty Saar. Yeah. And actually, I have to tell you, when I was having all this difficulty with the stereotypes and should I be doing this? Should I, you know, I mean, I was doing all that. I don't know, I was looking, I have like, like three or four books of Betty Saar here. <laughs> 
And somehow I look, I saw Mammy. I said, what are you, what are you talking about? Here's Betty Saw. So I was able to go, go and but but like her, I do the same thing. Now the thing is, she wasn't the first. The women in my family were hunters. My mother would go get this furniture and refurbish it and all this. So it it's like I do it in terms of putting these objects together so that they can tell a story. And they help me understand something. It's not always, as I said, with stereotypes, I'm still kind of like, what is this really about? And where is it going? You know, but um, I do find there's so much energy in the hunt and the discovery. And then finding that when those pieces come together, they tell a whole new story. Yeah, I'm a huge Betty Sarr fan as well. Um, I, I am really enjoying discovering the works of Allison and Leslie Sarr. And from what I understand, she has a third daughter who is a literary artist. And uh, I am going to get the chance to meet Allison Sarr um, in the fall because I have some pieces that will be at the Washington State University's uh, on-campus Museum of Fine Art. And that is part of a grant that um, that I was involved in uh, the Black Lives Matter artist grant that was funded by the Jordan Schnitzer found Family Foundation, and part of what part of the display of our works um, because there were several artists who won res their respective grants. All of these pieces are going to be displayed together uh, alongside work by Alison Saar in her in a solo show mm -hmm. and there is actually a chance that I will get to meet her and give her a card and maybe get to know her or something so I'm yeah. really excited about yeah. that yeah I also had the pleasure of meeting Betty Saar <sighs> in Seattle I don't know you, you guys wouldn't know but Linda Ferris Gallery hosted Betty Saar and her film, I think it's called Spirit Catcher, was shown at um, Cornish. And I had just come to town. I had seen it on PBS and I was going into the theater and there in the corner was Betty Sarr. I went in and I raced back out and it was like, I saw God, you know? <laughs> I was like, oh, I saw you. Anyway, she did, I'm gonna tell you, she did the most beautiful thing. She saw I was just, starstruck mm -hmm. but she invited me to a dinner at Linda Ferris's and I have to tell you I couldn't even talk I mean it was just it was such embarrassment that Linda Ferris came over to me says well who are you <laughs> you know, I'm somebody who is just so happy to be I, here. I was I couldn't even talk you know people were talking at the table and I was sitting there but it was like yeah I'm sitting by God you know I can't say anything but anyway she came back Years later, she came back to Seattle and I told her, I said, you know, you're not going to remember me, but, you know, she didn't remember that. I mean, it was like, but what I want to say is that she really recognized how I responded to her and her work. And she was really gracious to invite me to be there. You know, I can't tell what was all about, but I, I just hold that in my heart. She's always been a very gracious person. Yeah. Well, that's kind of almost a perfect segue. You brought up, um, well, one, I just want to acknowledge all the great comments, at least on the Facebook, people really appreciating the depth to both of your work, um, hearing about the history of these works. Um, so again, I'll share those with you later if you don't have access to them. Um, but. Uh, Cornish is where I went to school, and you mentioned Cornish, and Cornish is an interdisciplinary art school, and so I think it's really interesting when artists get inspired by other artists, which is what you guys just both mentioned, and so um, an artist, Sadiqwa Iman, um, was really um, moved by Carletta's work, um, The Night of the Stereotypes, and so I'm just going to read a little description, and we're going to see a premiere of the film Stereo. So um, what she wrote was a possession of the past, when Sadiqwa Iman entered the installation of Night of the Stereotypes by Carlotta Carrington Wilson at Wanawari, 
She had no idea the response would be so visceral. Wilson's art interrogates stereotypical images of African-Americans from the late 19th to early 20th century. And in the next installment of the momentum of the muse, Sadiqwa allows the energy of her Southern upbringing and love for watermelon to fuel a disturbing dance theater performance placed within the exhibition. As a viewer, Sadiqwa asks you to wrestle with your beliefs of what fuels stereotypes and what happens when those stereotypes are embodied in the 21st century. Is it harmful or empowering and to whom? So from there, I'm gonna uh, let us see the world premiere of Stereo by Sidiqua Iman. Thank you so much.
So very, very incredible. Wow. Thank you so much, Sidiqua. 
one for being inspired by the work in the house, in particular, obviously Carletta's. I know she walked around and got very, um, it was particular, the watermelons that inspired um, that piece and all the work, so much mean, meaning, right? Like it, I loved seeing her full of joy as I love watermelon and then seeing that joy taken away from her and her processing all of that in that film. We'll have opportunities to see that again. I just wanted to remind, one again, give an opportunity to thank Lisa Myers Bullmash and Carletta Carrington Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Please come uh, to Wanawari and see this work. It's super important work. Um, as you already know, um, like I said, you all have stayed with us in the comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your, um, your thoughts and um, observations and adding to the commentary about the importance of what they're working through in, this, in these exhibitions. And remember, you can see this work through August 1st, Sunday, August 1st, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Elisheba.